<laughs> well, I figured it was about time, week seven, that we started talking about the role that emotion has in worship. That has been a matter of contention, considerable contention, uh, between various branches of the church. But to be honest, I can't help feeling we've been looking at it from rather the wrong point of view. Because when we talk about the role of emotion in worship in light of Paul's words in Romans 12, right? Offer yourselves as living sacrifices. This is our obligation to submit ourselves entirely to God, emotions and all. It suggests to me that we should be looking at this in two ways. First, we need to make room in our worship for every condition of the heart. And at the same time, we need to make an effort to yield every emotion to the Lord, whether as an offering or as a, how do I put this? A request for change. Now, when we look at making room in worship for all conditions of the heart, you will notice if you look at the average Sunday morning service. It tends to be fairly standardized, right? We have um, quite often a very upbeat beginning, and then it scales back to something meditative before we go to the communion table. And then generally the communion table tends to be focused around right the institution of the lord's supper we worship in terms of prayer those generally are what you might call parochial very localized requests for prayer and then the word often i would say most of the time based on what the speaker is convinced is the most pressing need of the day. And then at the end, right, closing song, somewhat invitational, somewhat usually triumphant and, you know, high note to go out on. But if you look at the Psalms, the original worship manual of the Bible, and even now still sung in certain churches regularly, You'll, you'll find a much wider experience than what we normally represent in our Sunday morning corporate worship time. Uh, just to draw out some of the range of it in a certain portion, I'd like you to turn to Psalm 86. If you look at Psalm 86, 87, and 88 together, you'll notice there's a lot of variety just in those that are right in a row. Psalm 86, a prayer of David, Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am godly. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all the day. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. In the day of my trouble, I call upon you, for you answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. O oh God, insolent men have risen up against me. A band of ruthless men seeks my life, and they do not set you before them. But you, O oh Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, 
slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, faithfulness. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. Show me a sign of your favor that those who hate me may see and be put to shame because you, O oh Lord, have helped me and comforted me. Right. So this one, this one is uh, this basically the cry of a soul under threat who looks to God in submission and full trust for deliverance. You might have also noticed that this is the source of some of the lyrics for the song we sometimes sing, Cry of My Heart, right? Teach me your ways, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. And then you have Psalm 87, a psalm of the sons of Korah. On the holy mount stands the city he founded. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwelling places of Jacob. Glorious things of you are spoken, O city of God. Among those who know me, I mention Rahab, Babylon. Behold, Philistia and Tyre with Cush. This one was born there, they say. And of Zion, it shall be said, this one and that one were born in her. For the Most High himself will establish her. The Lord records as he registers the people, this one was born there. Singers and dancers alike all say, all my springs are in you. Now here we have a community celebrating the grace of God in choosing Zion as his dwelling place and, and drawing all nations there to worship. And yes, this is the source of the lyrics for glorious things as they are spoken. So already we have two quite different songs of worship. And then we hit Psalm 88. A psalm of the sons of Korah. O Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry, for my soul is full of troubles, and my life draws near to Sheol. I am accounted among those who go down to the pit. I'm a man who has no strength. Like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all your waves. You have caused my companions to shun me. You have made me a horror to them. I'm shut in that I cannot escape. My eye grows dim through sorrow. Every day I call upon you, O Lord. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the departed rise up to praise you? Is your steadfast love declared in the grave for your faithfulness in Abaddon? Are your wonders known in the darkness? Or your righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? But I, O oh Lord, cry to you. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. O oh Lord, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Afflicted and close to death from my youth up, I suffer your terrors. I am helpless. Your wrath has swept over me. Your dreadful assaults destroy me. They surround me like a flood all day long. They close in on me together. You have caused my beloved and my friends to shun me. My companions have become darkness. Unique. Among all the Psalms, Psalm 88 has no triumph in it. And the hope is only implied that because God has set his hand upon him and placed him in this dark period only god can lift him out of it and to god he cries but you'll notice there was no final note of you will it's only i can only trust that you will and keep calling on you so you see just in this one section we have three very different worship experiences you also notice that Psalm 88 gives us the lyrics for no congregational worship that I know of. Uh, in fact, the only song I really know of that's based on this is uh, there's a group called Enter the Worship Circle. And so, several years ago, they put out a series of albums called Chair and Microphone. There's just a single artist, one instrument. And the songs were very personal very intimate and usually based off the psalms and one of them it's called dead man is based on psalm 88 
It is the cry of someone who can't even bring himself to hope and yet still cries out to God because that is his only hope that God would intervene. Now, when you look at the variety of the Psalms, they make room for all manner of emotions, laying before God such things as a vindictive spirit. You know how many Psalms say, Lord, take vengeance on my enemies because I have not done nothing to them and yet they still afflict me. They persecute me for no reason. It lays before God as a feeling, just a deep sense of hopelessness. Lays before him joy, triumph, defeat, everything. And of course, for us, that's a very uncomfortable idea. In public worship, laying out all kinds of private, very personal emotions. But it is worth considering that we need to make room for them. And sometimes we can only make room for them in the prayer time. But we still need to acknowledge that when we draw together, we all draw together from a different direction. We come in different conditions. And so it's definitely worth remembering your worship team in prayer that they would be able to select songs that are more representative of the congregational experience so that people can bring before God all of these different things. I, I was one of the reasons I always felt very inadequate in worship was because I'm usually the last person to find anything out about people. I, I tend to be very oblivious to things like that. And yeah, so uh, my my only resort was as if, when I planned worship services was to pray really hard beforehand. Uh, help me pick the right songs. Help me put together something that will lead people to you. But that's not all. We have, as the heart of our worship, the gospel story. And the gospel story itself is full of emotions. Things beyond ourselves that we need to, we really do need, not only to acknowledge intellectually, but to take deep into our emotional life. You think about, right, we're coming up on the season of Advent. And you have moments that we will read about, like the angel of the Lord appearing to Joseph in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And we will inevitably sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel. And it's important to approach a song like that, a scripture like that, with the acknowledgement that God's people have always been awaiting people. And waiting is hard. It's far easier to give up waiting and go after something else or to fall asleep waiting. But to continue as we do, waiting, not for the first coming, but for the second. As we sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel, we realize this is not just an Advent song. 
when we read about Jesus' ministry. You know, there aren't a whole lot of, even in the, uh, in the old hymns, there aren't a whole lot of songs about Jesus' time of ministry. But then one occurred to me. We used to sing a lot in my childhood church. Fill my cup, Lord. John 14, John 4, I was looking at John 4, 14, right? <laughs> when Jesus meets that Samaritan woman at the, at the well and says, give me a drink. And she's like, wait, you, you're a Jewish man, right? And, and you're asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? <laughs> That's weird to say the least. And of course, his response, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that's saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. You see, the entirety of Jesus' ministry was more than bringing material blessings, healing or you know, wine for a wedding feast or bread, and fish for multitudes. He brought himself as living water, the bread of heaven. And so we sing things like, fill my cup, Lord, because we know that he still brings. And many people are still longing. And they place that longing in so many wrong places. We even do it ourselves. We get misdirected. We place our hopes in various schemes and plans and financial accounts and whatnot. And we always come back to, Lord, fill my cup. Fill it up and make me whole. Because only you can do this. Do we make room? in our worship, for that sense of longing. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes I just, <laughs> I just get tired of my own efforts. I'm like, you know, I've tried this, I've tried that, and I've tried everything else, and I'm obviously not trying the right things. But I want to be whole. I want to be what you intended me to be God. And then, of course, we approach the crucifixion. And, of course, we have a lot of songs about that. and We sing them reasonably often. But something occurred to me that, you know, I haven't sung since I was a little kid. And it's based... On Luke 22, Jesus praying on the Mount of Olives. Now, I don't know if you can remember the last time you sang Tis Midnight and on Olive's Brow, but I had to go back to a hymnal that was published in 1969 to find that one. Thirty-two. There we go. Right. It's not a. It's not a long hymn, right? And if you've never sung it, this is what it sounds like. Tis midnight, and on Olive's brow the star is dim, but lately shone. Tis midnight in the garden now. The suffering Savior prays alone. Tis midnight, and from all removed, the Savior wrestles lone with fears. Even that disciple whom he loved heeds not his master's grief and tears. Tis midnight, and for others' guilt, the man of sorrows weeps blood. Yet he that hath in anguish knelt is not forsaken by his God. We sometimes leave off meditating on, contemplating, the passion of Christ till around 
Easter time. It's a seasonal place, but we need to make room in our everyday worship to remember things like the agonized grief that Jesus suffered in anticipation of his death, not just in his death, but the anticipation of it. Do we share grief over our role in that? And of course, another old classic, Oh, Sacred Head, Now Wounded, which of course comes from that scene where they took Jesus and flogged him and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe, came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. And then Pilate takes him out and shows him off and says, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. And he comes out wearing the crown of thorns. And Pilate shows him off. Behold the man. Not just the grief he suffered in anticipation, but the humiliation, the scorn that he suffered for our sake. Do we make room to really feel, not just acknowledge, but to feel what that means? And there were just too many songs to choose from for the actual crucifixion. I have never yet been able to force myself to watch any movie based on that because and I'll just say having an overactive imagination is often not a good thing. <laughs> but one song that popped into my head as I was thinking about this, Up From the Grave He Arose. Right? If we look at Luke, we remember that one man gathered his courage to go to Pilate, even though, you know, he, he was not at that point, identified with Jesus' followers. Yet he's described as a good and righteous man who had not consented to the council's action and decision. And he was looking for the kingdom of God. So he gathers up his courage and he goes to Pilate and he asks to receive Jesus' dead body. And he takes it down and he takes responsibility for proper burial. And it had to be done in haste because the Sabbath was coming. And so they did what minimum had to be done. And then they went to rest according to the commandment, right? They were good Jewish people. And of course, right, in that song, right, low in the grave he lay, Jesus, my Savior, waiting the coming day. And then, of course, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes, right? Whole, whole lot of Roman soldiers stationed outside were not able to hold him in. In fact, they were not even able to stand in front of the angels who came. They, they, the stone that the women were so worried was going to be so heavy that they, well, how are we going to get somebody to roll that stone away? Eh, it was already gone moved like it was nothing. He is not here, but has arisen. The triumph of that. His resurrection is our triumph, our joy, and our hope for eternal life. And it's easy to just say those words. But how often in our worship do we meditate on what that really means to our everyday life? That we now need have no overwhelming fear of death, but a confidence that he will come for us. 
He'll take us to his home. He has gone to make a place for us. And his resurrection is our guarantee that his promises are true, that he will come for us, that to God, the dead are yet living. So we have that, but we also, in addition to making room for all the conditions of the heart, for making room in ourselves for the emotion of the gospel, we also are obliged to hold nothing back. And I've got a section here that's called songs we don't sing often enough, or in some cases, we don't sing at all. Because when we talk about all conditions of the heart, we kind of cringe a little bit, don't we? If we're honest. Because we know perfectly well that even in the course of a day, not every condition of our heart has been presentable for God's presence. We just know that. And yet, how often do we take time in worship to confess our times of temptation and encourage one another to endure faithfully? This may be something of a lost tradition in worship. In fact, I can only think of two songs that have anything to do with that. One of them is the children's chorus, Be Careful Little Eyes What You See, which, you know, it's probably good enough for a child level of temptation because they're usually still at that, well, God is watching, so be careful. But then there's another one, again, 1969 version of a hymnal, Yield Not to Temptation. I do not know I've ever sung this in a church service. But the words... Though sounding probably a little bit Victorian naive, they, they're they useful. Yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. And each victory will help you some other to win. Fight manfully onward, dark passions subdue. Look ever to Jesus, he will carry you through. Which is why I like this one better than be careful little lies what you see, because it's not just God is watching you, so be careful, but... In the midst of temptation, look ever to Jesus. He will carry you through. Ask the Savior to help you. Comfort, strengthen, and keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will carry you through. We need to have a space in our worship, even if it's just in our private worship, to remind ourselves of his promise, right? One that springs immediately to my mind, 1 Corinthians 10, right? No temptation has seized you except that which is common to man. He will make a way, provided you stand firm. Quite literally, it says God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And this is really important because when we talk when we talk about temptation, we're not just talking about the big, obvious, ugly ones that people are so proud of themselves for not having given way to. Those aren't really temptations if they're not tempting you. But for example, another one that was thinking of a uh, common temptation is that to anxiety. Have you felt overwhelmed by anxiety lately? And there's only uh, there's only so much I was able to find in in song, right? That we could use to encourage ourselves with this. And actually, the one that came first to my mind is probably one that I learned first in childhood. Children's chorus, I cast all my cares upon you. I lay all of my burdens down at your feet and any time I don't know what to do, I will cast all my cares upon you. Of course, this draws from 1 Peter chapter 5. We 
which is often taken out of context and not helpfully so, because it's set in the context of clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. We don't tend to think of anxiety as temptation to sin, but anxiety really is, and I'm speaking from personal experience here, very much tangled up in pride that I can handle stuff. But then there's that undercurrent of anxiety, but what about the stuff I know I can't handle? So I lay more plans. I look for contingencies. And yet there's that still that anxiety. But what about that stuff? What if it goes wrong? And I can only plan so far. And the faithful thing to do at that point. When I have done what is reasonable. to cast the rest on God because he does care. He's not sitting waiting for you to fail and then say, what good are you? He is waiting for you to humble yourself under his hand and say, I am in your hands. And I know right now is scary. But I also know that you care and that you're more than all the scary things. And I don't think it's a <laughs> I don't think it's a coincidence that he follows up with be sober minded and watchful because your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion. Giving in to temptation just for an example, the temptation to be overwhelmed by anxiety means opening the door to this roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And again, yield not to temptation. Resist him firm in your faith. You are not the only one. You are part of a fellowship of believers who are undergoing this same temptation around the world through the course of time. You're not alone. You see this wholehearted worship. It's less tidy and potentially more embarrassing than we would like. Right? Because we present before the Lord everything. The grudges, the prejudices we hold, the fears we don't trust him to resolve, the ingratitude we feel over the unwanted blessings. He didn't give us what we asked for. He gave us something else instead. And that sort of thing. But wholehearted worship is above all honest worship. We lay everything before our sovereign. I mean, you've heard it said, you might as well tell him because he already knows. But you also might as well submit everything to him because you can't handle it yourself. Well, you've tried. And worship then balances out heart and mind. We're fairly good at intellectual worship, right? We, we know the right words to say. We know the right doctrines. But balancing heart and mind safeguards the one from the other. 
neither one becomes dominant. We don't worship to gratify either our emotions, right? which has become kind of a kind of a thing, right? And we don't worship to gratify our intellect, like, oh, hey, we're right. Everyone else is wrong. But we lay everything before God because everything is his. And just to end, there is one song that I go back to, and this is, I will say, a private worship song. Uh, it's not something I probably would ever introduce for worship service because well, let's just say the wording is a little bit blunt in some places right but it's called even when it hurts it starts with a plea to take this fainted heart take this these tainted hands wash me in your love come like grace again even when my strength is lost I'll praise you. Even when I have no song, I'll praise you. Even when it's hard to find the words, louder than I'll sing your praise. Take this mountain weight. Take these ocean tears. Hold me through the trial. Come like hope again. Even when the fight seems lost, I'll praise you. Even when it hurts like hell, I'll praise you. Even when it makes no sense to sing, Louder then, I'll sing your praise. My heart burns only for you. You are all I want. My heart waits only for you. And I will sing till the morning has come. Even when the morning comes, I'll praise you. Even when the fight is won, I'll praise you. Even when my time on earth is done, louder then, I'll sing your praise. I will only sing your praise. Because sometimes you don't have a song. Sometimes it's hard to find the words. Sometimes it seems like you've lost and it really, really hurts. But that is the time to worship loudest. Reminds me of Job. Right After all the bad news, wave after wave after wave of bad news has come, and he's lost just about everything of value to him. And what remains is nagging him to curse God and die. What does he say? The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. May the name of the Lord be praised. That is wholehearted worship. And that's what we're aiming for. And if that doesn't daunt you just a little bit, <laughs> you might not have given it enough thought. We'll put it that way. <laughs>